All right, I'm back recording. Um, I'm going to I'm just going to save this. Oh, I didn't. I guess I didn't save this before. <clears throat> Okay, and then I'm going to close up ArcGIS, and uh, I'm going to open, actually before I open Pix4D Mapper, um, I guess I should have left, Pix, uh, I should have left, uh, I should have left uh, ArcGIS open, but um, one of the assignments on the syllabus is for you to produce a, um, a product, so kind of like what we've done uh, with by UPR, uh, or today what I'm going to show you with um, uh, with uh, what do you call it uh, with the data we collected last week. And so um, what I, what I basically want is you to produce the product and then c just describe it, okay? Um, and then take some measurements off of it. Probably the easiest thing to do is to is to measure a building or uh, a um, uh, or, or something else uh, with it. You can do that in ArcGIS, uh, which I think is the easiest. Uh, so you can make your map in ArcGIS. Uh, you could also do it uh, in Pix4D, uh, but I think the tool is a little more clunky for for mapping um, in in Pix4D. But I can show that some of that when we get to to that here. And so uh, the, what you're going to turn in is no more than a page for that that uh, that document. Okay, so should have should have a map and a little bit of description. Okay, um, there are yeah, the, you you can uh, borrow uh, a drone to to do this uh, or. Um, I can upload some data that I that I already created, or I can just give you some data that I already created. Uh, now it's just going to be raw data. I'm just going to give you images, and you'd have to stitch them together. Okay, so you can do either of those two choices. Um, I think it would be. I mean, the original assignment was to to use the drone, so um, feel free to come and and check it out. Uh, so, all right. I got to I got to make an assignment. I've got to make a an area where I can. Uh, I've got to make a a place on Canvas so you can actually turn that in. Okay, so Pix4D Mapper. Oh, actually, before we do Pix4D Mapper, let me let me talk about what we're going to do with this. Okay. That's uh, what I meant by I should have done this instead of waiting waiting for it to copy and then we could have taken another short break after a copy but this is fine okay so uh, under 492 today uh, I have this little uh, section that I this little slideshow that I called radiometric and I'm gonna go ahead and download that all right. These are slides that uh, my actually my advisor made uh, a long time ago. He's updated them, so I'm I'm not sure that when these were last updated. Uh, so these are slides that were similar to the slides that I that I was sat in as a graduate student and learned about uh, radiometric correction. And uh, a lot of people use this book. So anybody here? I forgot. I know I've asked this question before. Has anybody taken remote sensing? Does the slides look familiar? Okay. Cool. Well, I'm going to go through them fairly quickly, uh, it, probably five minutes, and then we'll, we'll go on and we'll actually apply it. Okay. Uh, so uh, I guess Dr. Carter is still using the same, uh, still using this, the same slides uh, that I would have used. Uh, they go with the book. Okay. So I didn't put the book chapter up there. If you're interested in that, uh, I can either lend you a copy of the book or uh, we can we can make you a photo photocopy. Okay. I'm going to simplify this down a lot, and uh, I think that it uh, that still makes sense, right? So 
the main source of electromagnetic energy is the sun, right? The sun is relatively speaking, I mean, you saw that first slide, right? There's a bunch of uh, hot spots, cold spots. The sun does actually, uh, you know, we can measure that it that it does actually have some fluctuation in in its uh, uh, in its brightness in certain areas, but that's not really important. We can model the sun uh, as a black body, meaning that it's like has this uh, this constant uh, uh, amount of radiation uh, that it's emitting out into the atmosphere, uh, and we could model that as what's called a black body. So just based on the temperature, we can infer. Uh, the type and the amount of energy coming towards us at different in different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so that's what that means, right? And 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 actually, most of the or the the peak of the energy that's actually coming toward the Earth, uh, that's uh, encountering the Earth's atmosphere, is in the visible portion of the spectrum. Right. So it's, it's either uh, anyway. It's kind of cool that that's the part that we see is the is the is the most amount of energy coming? Uh, so uh, we've got the sun, uh, the Earth, and we can think about all the different types of energy that the sun emits. Uh, we refer to that as the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, but the peak is in that visible portion, uh, and just outside, uh, uh, to more a little bit more toward the uh, um, longer wavelengths than the shorter wavelengths. So, all right. Um, that's all I want to say about that. So um, when that energy encounters the Earth, uh, it irradiates a location on the Earth. In other words, there's an amount of radiant flux incident to an area, uh, and then some of that energy leaves that area. It's reflected off of that surface. Okay, right? We haven't talked about atmosphere yet because the atmosphere is important. But here's the concept. So we've got uh, the sun's energy coming in, and it is uh, either absorbed or uh, transmitted in the case of uh, uh, something that's partially opaque, uh, or it's reflected. And that energy that's reflected out, referred to as excedence, it's the radiant flux that's leaving. And it doesn't just leave in one direction. It leaves in all directions. Sometimes it leaves in one direction more than another direction, okay? That has to do with uh, this concept of, of radiance. Radiance is the measurement of how much energy in watts per meter squared left a certain portion of the Earth, okay? This is, this is the closest thing that there is to what's actually detected by the sensor on our UAV, okay? It's it's an it's radiance and it'd be ideal if we could model this and come up with a uh, amount of energy in watts per meter squared per steradian. All that word means is in a certain direction, in a solid angle. Okay. So uh, in other words, if our sensor is right here relative to the object, the amount of energy that's going to be uh, recorded by the sensor is is this energy. Whoops. But if we're over here, it would be that energy. If we're over here, it would be that energy. Okay. It's it's uh, it's only in that in that steradian, that solid angle that's that's facing the detector at the time. All right. Now, uh, uh, one thing that we can do to try to um, correct our Im our imagery is to think about the fact that objects they reflect a certain amount of energy in in all directions, but sometimes it's a little more in one direction, sometimes it's a little more in another direction. But if we get a measurement of all of that energy, we could call that hemispherical reflectance. Hemispherical reflectance is the ratio between the irradiance, the what's coming in, and everything that left is the, ref, is the reflected energy. And we call that that ratio percent reflectance. Okay. Now, because, because of this problem, 
some of it, a little bit more of it might go in one direction than the other, but hemispherical reflectance can be actually measured for an object. We can, we can find different objects, we can multiply it by 100 and get percent reflectance, but we can find different objects and see for different wavelengths how much energy is reflected off of them. Okay, so this is the process I was trying to describe with those squares. So those squares, we've taken a measurement of their percent reflectance, and we have a number. So for that black uh, object, it's kind of close to the asphalt here, where it's a low percent reflectance, okay, close to, uh, close to and getting a little bit less than, than 10, okay? That's, that's for the asphalt. For the bright one, it would be up here. It reflects almost all of the incident energy. Okay? And we have to remember that these numbers have to be um, these numbers have to be known for, for all the different bands that there are. Okay. All right. That's what I wanted to do, but I don't know how I did that. Okay. So um, uh, also uh, it's important that uh, that we recognize that different reflectors will um, will reflect the incident light differently. So if we have something that is a perfect specular reflector, that means that the angle of incidence will have an opposite angle of accidents. In other words, there'll be a big bright spot right here, like smooth water. Okay. So another thing about our ground control targets is that they can't be, uh, we don't want them to be like this. We want them to be more like this, where it's a perfect diffuse reflector. Okay. In other words, it will reflect equally in all directions. Right? But in nature, we have some of these. Okay. All right, now this... This, like I said, this is taken from a remote sensing textbook, and it talks about uh, Landsat bands. We have bands, too, with our data. We have bands. Uh, we collected, uh, with the visible camera, we collected blue, green, and red. And with the near-infrared camera, we collected near-infrared and red. Okay. The near-infrared was collected in, in what's going to be called the blue band, like because... The phantom camera doesn't know that we did what we did. So it still stores the near infrared energy in what used to be the blue band, and it stores the red energy in what was the red band. Okay. All right. And so we need to know the spectral characteristics of the sensors that we calculate, I mean, that we're using in order to correct them. The idea is to come up with uh, a data set where instead of every pixel representing the brightness value, which is a surrogate for radiance, every pixel represents the percent reflectance. So that, that's the idea with radiometric correction. Okay. Now, there are some things that are, that are hard to deal with, um, uh, and that is the fact that it's a pretty complicated path that leads to the ground. Okay, we've got atmospheric scattering, Get different atmospheres, uh, different uh, different size particles that are causing scattering in different ways. You know, small uh, gas molecules are causing uh, basically the scattering of blue light, and that's why always in imagery that's not corrected, uh, you'll you'll see you know the the blue is the most hazy, the blue band, the blue portion of the spectrum is the most hazy because even gas molecules are large enough to cause uh, scattering in that portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Larger particles like smoke and dust and water, I'm going to kind of lump them together, they cause almost all the electromagnetic spectrum to scatter and they create um, haze in an image that's fairly uniform. Okay, an example of this would be a cloud in the way. That's a whole lot of non-selective scattering. Okay. Now, with a drone, we're usually flying under most clouds, but um, there, are, there still can be things in the air that are causing the signal not to be uh, the same as it would be on a day where 
So let's say there wasn't any humidity in the air, or there wasn't any uh, uh, there wasn't any uh, uh, smoke or any any dust in the air. Okay, so th those are different days. They could be causing different effects. So most of these types of things are really hard to correct for, even using the techniques we're going to talk about today. So you want to try to hold those things constant, okay? But they, they are going to correct uh, some of them. So this is just a, a, a chart showing here why blue light is more scattered than other light. Okay. There are portions of the electromagnetic spectrum that, that actually are, are uh, opaque to the incoming radiation. We don't have to worry about this with the drones because we didn't remotely sense anything in these these areas that are dark. Okay, meaning that there's no there's no energy there because the atmosphere actually doesn't allow uh, much of anything to penetrate uh, through. Okay, but most of these are outside the visible. So visible is right here, oh, right there. Okay. So water vapor is kind of the closest to that and. And ozone and uh, I don't know what what both of those formulas are, but they are they are causing some of the incident uh, uh, visible light not not to not to be able to penetrate. Okay. All right, this complicated chart you don't need to memorize it or anything. Uh, just shows all the potential paths that the solar irradiance could take down to Earth, reflect off the surface, and go back to the sensor. So. There's, there's a lot of these paths that are hard to um, to model, and they can even be different in different portions of the image, right? So we've got the en energy coming down, uh, the diffuse sky irradiance, the the, uh, the the scattering of the the incoming energy that I just talked about. That's that's in that category, okay? That the sky itself could be partial is partially opaque or par not completely transparent uh, because uh, the light gets scattered and creates a haze and the haze can be different on different days okay uh, it might hit a cloud and that cloud it penetrates part of the cloud and goes through and now the lights kind of going off all in different directions so if we have big clouds right here okay that's a different that's a different type of atmosphere that's going to affect the solar irradiance differently so we could also get uh, reflecting from nearby areas. I talked about that a little bit last week. We're out in the field that's basically blooming. Okay. And then going back up, it could hit other things before it reaches the sensor. Our sensor is fairly close. It's not in outer space. Our sensor is fairly close. It's one of the advantages of, of the drone. So our sensor is fairly close, but it could still interact with the atmosphere going back up. But most of what we're concerned about is this path using UAV uh, remote sensing okay so these are these are all the potential paths in the remote sensing class you know I have people memorize it and reproduce it on the test but we're not we're not going to do that so we got each of these each of these four paths okay. so what the sensor measures is the, the the radiance at the sensor is a combination of all of these different paths okay uh, it would be ideal if we could boil this formula down and actually tease out the individual constituents. And there are researchers that attempt to do that, okay, using models of the atmosphere at certain places. This makes more sense for satellite data uh, because with satellite data, the, uh, the, the, the resolutions that we're talking about typically are more coarse. Uh, and so we can come up with average uh, estimates of... Um, of uh, of atmospheric parameters, right? But we're not we're not going to do that for the for the drone data. For the drone data, what we need to focus on is keeping, whoops, keeping the values here as constant as we can, as similar as we can between image dates, and then applying a different technique. The first technique that we could apply is simply to take the histogram and adjust the histogram to reasonable values. If we took our data and we, it was underexposed, then we could, we could do something to stretch the data so that we got uh, a, a, a better looking 
data set. This is satellite data, but um, you know, if this was the uh, the original data, this could be the adjusted data. So now we don't have. In this case, it was overexposed. We don't have any values close to zero, and so we stretch our data back so that it it starts at zero. The very darkest pixel is zero. Okay, that would increase the contrast in our imagery and make it look uh, make it look better. All right, um, so what we can do to uh, correct our data, if we assume that the, those, all those atmospheric parameters were fairly constant throughout our data collection, then we can use those ground targets to uh, apply a concept called empirical line calibration. And what empirical line calibration does is that we attempt to um, make an image where every pixel represents the percent reflectance for that pixel rather than the radiance for the pixel. And uh, what we need to do is take the radiance value that we get, in other words, the, uh, the digital brightness value, multiplied by some gain plus some offset. So it's basically a linear. This is Y, y equals mx plus b. Our, our output field spectra is going to be equal to some gain that we don't know what it is times a digital number times some offset. Okay, so reflectance is equal to, the, to, this, to this value. So how do we derive the gain and the offset values? Just through a linear function. That's how we do it. Okay, so typically the analyst chooses a dark and bright region. Okay, that's talking about satellite imagery. That's usually what's done because it's hard to get a big target out there that would be big enough for for satellite data. So if we choose like a deep water place, so that's somewhere we know is bright and sunny, bright and sandy beach, we could uh, we could we could do that. However, the ideal is that we actually have regions with known reflectance. So in our case, we could we could put out um, targets, and if those targets have a known reflectance, we can use those targets to derive a linear function uh, and then apply that linear function to the data, and then we'll have a map of reflectance, okay, rather than percent reflectance, and we can, I mean, rather than radiance, and we can compare that over time uh, and say, okay, well, it's getting greener or it's getting less green or uh, things like that. All right, so this is this is basically how that's done. So we have uh, each band, right, and we have a bright target, we have a dark target, and then we come up with the number that represents. What if these things work yet? Oh, cool. Except for I have no idea how to get rid of it. Maybe, maybe. Oh, cool. Wow. All right. I don't. I wonder if it shows up on the screen. It does. So it's even being recorded. All right. Uh, cool. So uh, we have a bright target and our dark target. In this case, we have. We just. We decided to get three pixels. Okay. We could get nowadays. We could. We could circle around and get like seven or eight pixels. Nine, ten. We could. We. I think for our particular area, we're going to be able to get at least twenty pixels for our bright target and our dark target. Okay. So we'll have uh, we'll have the radi the image for each band. We'll have a, fu a function like this. We can we can plot it. So we can set this up in Excel. So we can find the values uh, here on this on this side, and then plot them against what they should be. In other words, their percent reflectance. So this oops. Let's go back. This is from zero to a hundred usually. Or in our case, from you know, point point zero to uh, one. Sorry. So there we go. So point zero to one or zero to hundred, depending on whether you're using percent reflectance or uh, another number. Okay. So what this is saying is, in this area, these dark areas are actually should still be reflecting. You know, zero or whatever, or sorry, 0.1, whatever, and then, and then we we come up with this with this, uh, sorry, 
with this function. And once this uh, formula is set, once this value is set, this is just a regression equation. So we can walk through that in Excel. Once that's set, we can then apply that formula, this side of the formula over here, we can apply that formula because this number and this number will be um, derived through that, through that regression equation. It's trying to fit the best possible line it can through that data. I need to stop touching it. Okay, Best possible line through that data, and then we can apply that to the remainder of the image. Okay, So we're going to walk through that now. Right, but before we do that, I think uh, well, you can also you can also do this even if you didn't collect ground control targets. Let's say you went out with the drone seven times and the atmospheric con conditions were pretty close to similar, uh, but you still wanted to to correct it. If there was any target inside the image that you know didn't change, that you that you know didn't change, which can be problematic, right? Like, you know, even asphalt changes over time. Right, you, you have when it's first laid down, it's like bright, and I mean, sorry, dark black, and that, over time it gets darker. So that wouldn't really be a good thing to to, to choose. But uh, if there was a really deep body of water, uh, if there's something you know didn't change, it'd be problematic. But let's say you you found some targets that you knew didn't change, you could use one image to correct the other images. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do this where we have targets. Okay targets and uh, in our case it says field spectra we didn't actually go out and measure it but we measured it in the in the lab okay all right I think that's the last slide no. yeah I didn't I don't I don't even think I didn't even think I meant to put that one in there but you can uh, you can correct based on the sensor orientation which is really hard to do with with the drone data because there's a different sensor orientation for every single image so with the satellite scene, the sensor uh, orientation can be computed uh, fairly uniformly, but for drone data, it's hard. So we need to just try to keep that constant or be hoping that we're trying to sense things that are, that are fairly diffuse reflectors. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to show you what I did here. Escape. Uh, discard. Oh, I forgot to log out of my computer, but that's easy. I just found this out a couple weeks ago. Nope, that's all I'm meant to do. License management. So I can go here and I forgot which one of these is which. <laughs> I'm just going to go log out manually. Two minutes. I forgot which one's my home computer, which is running an important process, and which one is my office computer, which isn't doing anything. Yeah, and, and uh, after after class, I'll um, I'll make sure I don't sign on to more than one of these at a time. So that if you want to use one of those computers, we can do that.
because I'm actually not going to run any anything uh, in here. We'll just look at our results. So I'm going to open up the uh, the project and show you how I ran it because uh, we don't really have time to watch it run because it took a little while. Uh, so I have this folder here called uh, LT, which stands for Lake Throw 2019. I don't think it's the only time I'll go out there, but okay. So um, this is junk, I think. That was the first one I created and it didn't work. Okay, so um, let me put this back on. I'm going to put back on my collar, my NASCAR driver thing. All right, um, let me go ahead and start opening this because it will take a little while. So I, op I have two, two projects, one for each data set. So uh, let's just look at the RGB product project first. It's going to tell me that my... Uh, it can't find my data, and that's okay because it's now in a different place. So now it's right here, and I and now it now it can find that data. And so um, this is the data that we collected for the RGB data set. Okay, and if I click on one of these, you can see that it's it's the data that we collected. And um, as I thought, this this wasn't ideal. It wasn't like it's a horrible day. But it, this wasn't an ideal day to collect data. There, uh, there are still some some clouds that moved in and out that made it slightly uh, bad. Uh, so uh, we well, were still going to run through the process. But in in the ideal world, I would have probably waited for a better day uh, to collect the data. Okay. So the workflow when you want to when you want to do a project like this, there's two different things we're going to do. So I'm, I'm kind of getting back and forth. So I'm going to explain those. Okay. First. We collected two different data sets of the same area. One had imagery that looked like uh, this. Or, sorry. LT. One had data that looked like that looked like this, right? And one had data that looked like this. I'll get this. This will look a little better. One data looked like that. This is the near infrared data that we collected. You can see our, our ground control points are right there. In fact, it's really, really hard to see the, the gray one. So we should have stuck it somewhere better. Uh, but that's okay because we really, we're really just going to use the dark and the bright one for, for today. Okay? So here's all of us. Here's the dark and the bright pixel, uh, the dark and the bright uh, ground control point. But you could see in this data set, the areas that are really bright means that it's bright in both the red and kind of bright in the near infrared, but it's brighter in the red. See how see how these areas appear red? That means that it's bright in the red and not quite as bright in the near infrared. And the near infrared is actually in the blue band. So that's why the trees, which should have a bright near infrared signature, appear more blue because they they have a higher value in that. And it's not corrected. In fact, because ideally we would have collected using the raw data, but the J, whenever you collect using JPEG, it actually applies a filter to it. And so it's really not corrected. It's, it's, they're trying to, to balance, the, the, the phantom is trying to balance this for a pleasing visual picture when it's no longer even using RGB anymore. So that's another reason why we need to correct the data. So it should ideally, you know, if, especially if we used one of those uh, those white balance corrections that were just based on a, a degree Kelvin, which we did. Ideally, it will still be on a linear scale, okay? So the the, the colors are still on a linear scale, but there's a totally different scale in the blue band than the than the red band, and it's not related to the actual reflectance. So that's one reason why we need to correct it. So we've got these two data sets. Okay, so getting back to the thing, there's two things that we need to do. First, we need to understand how to process a data set like this that has two different uh, sets of images of the same area. Okay, so all of these uh, softwares that are like this do this, but Pix4D, I think, does the best job at this particular operation. So um, what we can do is we can throw them all into the same project, and it will build a common digital surface model, and it will apply that digital surface, the common digital surface model 
to a um, uh, so when it builds the orthos, it'll it'll create a separate ortho for each data set. And so what that does is it is it uh, it has the effect of of geo rectifying both of those data sets together so that they're uh, they're uh, they have the same spatial co-location of every object that it detects. So they're like this car, for example, will be in the exact same position. It will be very close. It won't be exactly, but it'll be very close to as if they were acquired by the exact same sensor. Okay. So we'll see that. That's the first thing we're going to do. The second thing that we're going to do is actually uh, take the the results, and in ArcGIS, we're going to we're going to uh, correct this using um, uh, using empirical line calibration. Uh, Pix4D does have an interface for this, and I'll show it to you. Uh, but uh, I don't like how it, it, it's not a full empirical line calibration. I'll, and I'll show you what I mean uh, when we get to that point. Um, all right, so uh, so we've got this open. So, so the workflow is that you actually create two projects independent of each other. You create project A. And then you create project B. And, and project A contains all of the images from one camera. And project B contains all the images from the other camera. So I've called this LT for Lake Thoreau RGB. And I have another data set. Or sorry, I shouldn't have done new project. This will work, but I meant to just open the other project. Well, here, I'll keep this open here for a second, because this will be important. Okay. And then I've created another project. Keep opening that, so I might as well just close it, right? I could create another project. I've created another project for the near infrared, and I'll just open this project up. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and I got to tell it where the paths are, which is fine. Okay. Okay. They're all in <coughs> NIR. So, okay. So now once this pops open, the only difference between these two projects is the camera that was used. And so remember the wizard at the very beginning? I can get back to it by going image process, image, uh, uh, image properties editor. So what I've done, by default, it names everything group, group one. So what I did is I have to change in one or the other, or both, which is what I did in both. You change the name of the group. And if you change the name of the group, it'll create a separate ortho photo for each group. So here I have an ortho photo called NI. I mean, here I created a group called NIR. And in my other, in my other one, in my other project, if I open up the image process properties editor, I have a group called RGB. So it will create a RGB output and an NIR output when the projects are run. However, they're right now they're they're in two projects. I need to merge them into the same project. But there's one other thing I need to to talk about. So the other thing that I need to talk about is cancel that. I'm gonna go back over to here. The other thing I need to talk about is that I have to actually edit the camera model uh, so that because the camera model contains everything about the internals of the camera, but it also contains the uh, the specifications of the bands that this particular sensor collects. So what I did was I hit edit, and I don't need to change anything else on here except for this part right here. So I'm going to hit edit, and then I'll I'll edit. The rest of this all stayed the same because it was still a Phantom 4 Pro camera. I just we just took uh, changed the filter, so we need to change and edit that. And I'm just going to show you. I'm not going to save it again, but I hit edit like what was that four times? Edit a bunch of times, and you can see that I need to specify the the name of the band. I should have changed this, but I didn't. I kept it blue, and so I should have changed that to NDVI. Uh, I mean, sorry, sorry, near infrared, NIR, but I didn't. And so I just have to remember that later, okay? So when it says blue, it's near infrared. 
And then I change the wavelength right here to be the center of the band. And so the, the company that actually uh, I hired to do this, it's called I, IR Mods, uh, they, they, they publish this information. And so the filter, um, uh, the, center, the center wavelength that the filter allows to pass through is 660 and 850. And then the bandwidth is the distance from the center on either side. So it's about eight, this one's about 80 nanometers wide on the filter, and this one's about 50 nanometers wide on this filter. And I, I don't, I had the original fact sheet some, somewhere, but uh, I, all I, could, all I could get for this class is, um, sorry, IR mods. It was my, my email exchanges when I originally went and purchased. So this is the one I got, the red eight. So you can see uh, that you know 650 is about right here, and the width of that is about 40, about 80. I, I mean I didn't, I didn't just eyeball it. I got the, the the actual parameters from the guy, but but uh, this this is showing you that it matches what I what I had. Okay. So there's the red eight. It goes from 800 to 900. It's about 50. Tab. All right, and then finally the weight. Now, uh, oh, and then also I just uncheck the middle. There's nothing in there. You saw that it doesn't. The the filter shouldn't let anything get in there. Now there is some stuff there, and the phantom camera then stretched it back. So so you will see something there. But I'm telling I'm telling the phantom that that's. I mean I'm telling Pix4D that that's garbage. So I uncheck that box. And it actually writes the word garbage. I didn't write that. Uh, so that's Pix4D's term. So I'm telling it it's garbage, and it writes garbage there. And then this weights it, and the default weight is is uh, the default weight. What I, I went back and read the help, and it said that uh, the the bands that you want to weight the the heaviest are the bands with the most contrast. And typically those are the longer wavelength bands because the shorter wavelength bands have more scattering. Okay. And so in an RGB, uh, red gets uh, red gets like 70% by default. And so I did 60-40 because of the in near infrared's even a little bit more uh, way. But I, I'm sure people could experiment with that and and see if it produced any better results. But this one actually did produce fairly decent results. I think some of it's a result of our of our data, not. Uh, not using 6040, but anyway, so that's what I did. 6040. Those are the changes that I made. I'm just going to hit cancel all the way out. Uh, so those are the only two changes I made. I changed the group and I changed the camera model. If you don't change the camera model, it's actually not a huge deal. Uh, the camera model is more about uh, is is more about its ability to to do matching. And so if you left it still using red, green, and blue, it would it would still match uh, because uh, it would just have different weights associated with them, and it wouldn't know that they're near infrared bands. Okay, uh, but it would still work. If you didn't change the group, it would throw them all into the same at the end and create uh, kind of this weird data set. It would it would look really weird. It's like it's like two different flavors of ice cream got mixed together. Okay, so you don't want to do that. So you make sure that you uh, that you change the group, okay? All right. So then, at that point, you merge them together by doing something like this. I'll show you that step because that's pretty easy. So you go to create a new project, and you create a new project. This is just Pix4D's workflow. So somebody else might have a slightly different workflow. Okay. Merge uh, project merge from existing project. So you just select that, and I'm just going to call this, uh, you know, test. So I know that it's because I actually did this already. And then you just add the projects, which I think I might have to save now that I moved them onto different computers. Uh, here, real quick, I'll do that. Project, save. And then, um, then I pick the two projects, which are both on LT. There we go, Pix4D. And I pick the two projects I want to merge, which are the near infrared and the RGB. And when I merge them, I call it LT all. 
Uh, so this one I just called test. So we'll go back and open LT all to show the results. All right, so this is where it gets, some projects have objects with the same name and type. Do you want to treat them as identical? You hit no there. You don't want to treat them as identical. They're different projects. And then um, it tells you they haven't been processed. Uh, typically, uh, that's true, but you don't, you don't actually have to have them processed uh, for this particular application. It'll still process them all. Uh, so, so when you're doing two different cameras, just say no. But like, let's say, let's say you were processing two projects that were actually meant to be two spatially. They had the same camera, but they were spatially uh, next to each other. They're spatially contiguous projects, and you wanted to merge them that way. In that case, you would want them to process beforehand. Okay, so it doesn't know what we're trying to do, so. We'll just say OK and hit Finish. And it's OK that they're not processed. And now we've got all of them in the same data set. Now we can choose you know, what outputs we want uh, to have modeled and just press Start, and it'll go. OK? All right. Now, I told you the PIX4D does have its own radiometric correction thing. And I'll show you how to do that now. And then we'll do it a different way using empirical line calibration. Okay, so uh, PIX4D, if you wanted to do your, your, uh, your radiometric correction, now would be the time to set it up. And I'll show you how to do that real quick. So what you would do is you'd go into processing options, and you go to DSM orthomosaic index, and you go to index cal calculator. And you'll notice that there is a radiometric processing and calibration step that it will do for you. So by default, no correction is applied, none at all. Okay. So um, and also, if you want to actually output the reflectance map, even if you do this, you still need to do. You still actually need to click GeoTIFF. So I'm not sure what that will will do since we don't have any radiometric correction uh, yet. Uh, but uh, by default, it actually cuts it into tiles. So if you want it for the whole area, you click Merge Tiles too, and, and you'll get that. OK, so let's go up and talk about uh, this. No correction. We need to click Camera Only. Right? That's the only option that's actually highlighted. There are specific cameras, and the one that I was going to show you is one of these cameras, that have a sun irradiated sensor on top of the, the camera itself. So the parrot sequoia has a sun irradiance sensor. So every time it takes a picture downwards, it's measuring how much energy is coming in. So it's really, really convenient. So you just click, uh, you just click either sun irradiance or sun irradiance with sun angle. It will, it will attempt to model the sun angle. It needs, to know what, it needs to know what time it was. So that information can be derived from the GPS if it's there. Uh, so Anyway, this, these two options will be available if you use a Parrot Sequoia or a Red Edge, MicaSense Red Edge. If you use some sensor that has a sun irradiance uh, sensor on top of it, okay? I'm not really even sure what the this one is. DLS IMU. I, I know what an IMU is, but I'm not sure what that what the, the, what that one means. But uh, but these will both be enabled uh, if you if you have the the right camera, but we don't have the right camera. We only have camera only, so we have to choose camera only in both of these places. Okay, and then in order to in order to actually give it data, we have to hit calibrate. Okay, so what you have to do is you have to find an image where your radiometric target exists. And in Pix4D, the thing I don't like about it is it only lets you choose one target. So you, you, you can only have a target, which I think it's more important. I think it's important to have both a bright target and a dark target. Okay? So it's, it's calibrating everything from a single target, uh, which, I mean, theoretically can be done. But if you have two, uh, it's, it's better. Because you know, if, you, if you're off by a little bit on one, you know, who knows what it's going to look like. So this is the way you do it. You hit browse, you find an image with your target in it. And by the way, another thing is you're only allowed to, to do one image. 
So you don't, you can't get an average uh, value. So we could choose this one because it's in there. Hit open, and uh, and then zoom uh, down in. He, oops. I, I can zoom with the mouse wheel, but for some reason not letting me pinch and zoom. So you zoom down in here like this, and you right click, or sorry, yeah, you left click, the regular mouse click, inside your target. And then you double click to finish. Or no, right click to finish. Right click to finish. And then you can enter the uh, reflectance factor. The reflectance factor is the is is the percent reflectance for that target in that band, and so you enter a number there. Okay. Uh, let's see. I I have them up here, so I'm going to cancel out of this, and I'm going to open LT all, and I believe I have the the data sets marked in that image. So I'm going to open up. Um, I'm going to open up this one. Oh, yeah. No, no. So I actually, well, I'll, I'll just, it'll open up and I'll explain what I did here. All right, we only have a few minutes, so I'll go through this fairly quick. I did actually do this. I don't know if I messed up. I went I clicked something too fast. Why isn't it? Okay, good. All right, so this is the this is the the one that's already processed. I think it should be. Let's see. Oh, well, we can look at it here. It didn't actually finish the very last one, but it it did. I, I have it. I have a version where I finished. So I'll explain what I did. <laughs> I'm. I'm uh, getting okay. So I calibrated these, and I used the wrong. No, I actually did. So it saved the right ones. I did at first. I actually put the percent reflectance in, but I did one minus the percent reflectance, and so uh, my values here were, should have been 0 0.7 and 0.75. But I mean, that, that's what I that's what I put in the first time, and so it screwed up the result. And I attempted to rerun it this morning right before class using the right values, which should be 0.3 and 0.25. And that's what happened. It didn't quite finish uh, that, that result is what, is what happened. Okay? So um, those are the values for the, the black target. So 0.3 and 0.25, meaning that's the percent reflectance in the red band and the near infrared band for that, for that target. Okay? So those are the numbers that I should put in there. And then I have the other ones for here where red was uh, 0.3. Um, ooh, that's not, that's not right. I accidentally messed that up again. So that should be 0.25 because it should be the same in both red, red bands. Okay. And then uh, those are the right values going up. They reflect a little bit more uh, in those green and, and blue bands. Okay. All right. So uh, that's that's what you do. You just put the numbers in and and you run it. And uh, and so I ran it with with the opposite of those numbers uh, by accident. And uh, I do have that result here. So let me just show that. <clears throat> So 
So to ask for near infrared or red? Dang it. I think it was these first. All right. We might actually have to get to the empirical ion calibration next week. When so next week, what are we going to do? Well, I haven't found the parrot sequoia, so uh, I would like to be able to fly the fixed wing. If I find it, maybe I'll send out a thing that says, "Hey, we'll we'll, we'll try to do that uh, next week." More than like more likely, what I'll do is I'll send out a thing that I found it, and I'll and I'll fly it either Monday or Tuesday. I don't know if you guys have time, but I'll fly it then and we'll collect the data. So next week on Wednesday, let's just stick with the plan of meeting in class on Wednesday. And so what I'd like to do is, is talk about other data derivatives that we could get uh, from the, the data. Can we, can we do something like count trees uh, with, with the data? So that's, that's what I'd like to talk about next week. Uh, or processing the, uh, the pair of data, if I could find the, the sensor. OK. Um, Okay, yeah, that works. All right. So what I want to do here is to show you the uh, the report. So when you when you run it like this, you get a common DSM and you get a um, a data set that represents the uh, the um, the near infrared sensor and the RGB sensor. So w when you run it like that, those are the outputs. And uh, if I look here, if I look in, in the DSM ortho, I have the, uh, if I go to the mosaic, I have the near infrared mosaic and the RGB mosaic. These aren't radiometrically corrected, okay? The radiometric correction, if I, if I put one in, is right here under index. So here's my reflectance data, and I forgot to select merge tiles. So they're all individual tiles. So these have been radiometrically corrected, but they were radiometrically uh, corrected using the wrong numbers, the one minus numbers. So um, let's go ahead and look at these in ArcGIS, because this is a much smaller data set, and they, they do show up in ArcGIS. So, so I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to start this uh, this process of doing the empirical line calibration in ArcGIS, but but we might finish it. Uh, we might finish it next week. Um, okay, so I'm going to actually create a new project and call it. Uh, I I guess I just called it untitled. <laughs> Save as. Uh, by up here, UAV course, uh, new folder, I'll call it uh, LT for Lake Thoreau, because I can't spell Lake Thoreau. And I'll just name it Lake Thoreau Empirical Lion Calibration, ELC. All right, so now I can uh, add a new map and then put my data that I've that I collected on here. So I'll show you... Uh, LT 2019. So in my uh, archive data set where I actually ran through, I've got the, sorry, the DSM, which I'm not going to show. I've got the near infrared and the RGB data sets. Okay. So this is, this is the stretched, by default it stretches it, so that's why it looks kind of green. Uh, it's because it has a, those those values have a the this these are the highest near infrared values where there's vegetation. Okay, um, and then this is the RGB data set. And if we look like if we zoom way down in here, so even though these were taken from totally separate images, look at how close. You know, see, see the windshield on there? Look at how close. It's not exact, but they're really 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 close in terms of the two data sets. Okay. I mean, within probably a pixel or two. Let's see on this building if we could see see that line right there. It's hard to, it's hard to even see that line in the near infrared Im imagery. 
But some of that is just that the shadow appears brighter in one of the images than the other. Okay, but it's it's really really uh, registered, co-registered. Okay. All right. Uh, so that's that's what you get when you run it uh, to see together. So um, one of the first uh, steps that lots of times we want to do is throw all of this data into um, one five band image instead of two instead of two three band images. So there is a tool in ArcGIS called composite bands. So this creates a single raster data set from multiple bands. Okay. So we can run this tool and we could just stick these right into it, but if we do, it'll stick all of the bands in for those. So I like what I like to do is to go in and get the individual band. So I go back here and uh, and find the data set that has the information I want. That's under DSM Ortho, Mosaic, RGB. So I'm going to start with the RGB bands. I'm going to go into this and I'm going to choose uh, band one first. So, so the red band will become Actually, I'm going to go the opposite direction. So I'm going to kind of go by wavelength, right? So now the blue band will be the first band in this output raster data set. Okay. And then I can add the green band. And then I can add the red band. So now band one will be blue, green, red. And then band four in this new output data set will be band one from this other data set which is also red so these are both red now they're going to look slightly different one because the filters are different second because the stretch that the drone applied thinking this was just a, a normal picture it'll be different and then finally i'm going to select the near infrared band which is band uh, three the blue band as band four, so I'm going to call this. Uh, that's that's a that's an okay place to put it. So I'm going to call this uh, uh, all, or sorry, LT. I'll just call it LT all. I'm going to say R. I mean, sorry, blue, green, red, red, near infrared. Just to help me remember what the band order is. So now it's going to stack all of those into a, a single image. So it used to be that we had two three-band images. In fact, our, our, for some reason, Pix4D always outputs four bands, which is kind of annoying because 90% of the time you don't have a fourth band. But that fourth band is, is empty uh, unless you have a four-band data set. So see, see if I go, what I'm talking about. If I go like this and... Uh, Let's go to source, band information. See, it has, uh, has four bands. For some reason, it, it creates a, a four-band image, uh, even if your inputs were three bands. All right, this is taking a little while to run, but what it's going to do is stack all those images up so that they're uh, the same uh, value. But we don't actually have to have that finished in order to start our empirical line calibration. Uh, it'll be nice because we can we can apply apply them apply them all later in the same band, but we don't we don't have to do that. So what we need to do is zoom in to this this uh, area where our targets were and find out what the values, the average values in our uh, data set are. I'm going to have to stretch this a little bit to see that better. So let's go to symbology. Yeah, that's a little bit better. I'm just trying to be able to make sure I can see the targets. And they look very, very similar in this data set. This is the gray target. Okay, we're not even going to use the gray target. 
Okay, we're going to use the, the bright target, I mean, sorry, the dark target and the bright target. Okay, and so we need to find out what the values are in each band for those, those areas. Okay, so the tool that I like to use for this is called zonal statistics. Or zonal statistics is table. Everybody know what that, uh, that does basically? We can find the average value inside of a polygon of a raster data set. And so that's, what we're, that's all we're trying to do. I'm just telling you how to do it. Another way would just be to click like seven or to click like seven or eight times, right? But that that would that would be tedious. Now let's make sure that these oh it it finished, so that's good. Let's go ahead and look at that real quick because this this will actually help for for what we want to do. All right. So now what we're seeing is band one two three. It's the opposite of uh, of uh, so band one, so if we go band three, two, one, then we'll get a natural color image. And you can see what I mean. Actually, you could have seen it before, but uh, see this problem right here? You can see what I mean with the, with the sun. It's not like, it's not like horrible. There's, there's some shading right there. And typically, we want it to all be uniform in order to come up with a percent reflectance map. It's also shaded over here a little bit. There's some, some areas in here where there's a little bit of shading as well. The other problem is that, I forgot to point this out, but you might have already noticed, it didn't stitch really well right here. Okay, so uh, that could have been because the tree is shaking or whatnot. Okay, all right, so now we have this data set. If we want to look at a, a false color composite, we could say five, no, sorry, we put that in here, five, and we could choose either three or four. I'm going to go with, uh, let's try four first, see what it looks like. Five, four, two. Okay. <coughs> well, once we do the, the calibration, I'm going to expect a little bit different data set. But uh, you could see that the, these, these trees that are among the, 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 the most vigorous trees, they're, they're, they're a mix of deciduous. Most of these are pines. So these are a mix of deciduous. They appear the most red. Let's see, these appear really red. There, there's a pond right here. So those are those are really uh, vigorous trees. Let's see if we do five, three, two, just to see if the if the red band is better. Yeah, the red the red band is a little bit better in the. Uh, this looks more like a real true color, I mean false color composite. So the red band's a little bit better in the visible. So now we've got the the uh, the near infrared, the red, and the green. In, in is what we're displaying. And so anything that appears uh, red, very bright red, is very high uh, in, uh, in intensity of the vegetation. So uh, we've got uh, these, these areas right here, a few other areas right along the trace. I think we should probably ignore uh, everything to the left of this because it didn't stitch really well because some of this is just the fact that the images aren't co-registered uh, very well at all. Okay. In fact, this might be too because it's close to the edge of the image. But but this is th this is legitimate and so is that. Those are those are the those are the bright areas where the the trees aren't as aren't as vigorous in here, particularly in that region. All right. So what we want to do is is correct this and we should see a little bit more contrast. Uh, after we correct it, okay? And so um, what I'm going to, to, to do for the empirical line calibration is, is draw polygons inside each of these boxes. It's kind of neat how we get better contrast as well looking in the near-infrared band uh, than we do just in the visible, particularly for this, this uh, bright uh, target, okay? All right, so we, what we want to do is create boxes in each of these targets that are fully within the target and don't contain any mixed pixels. And so uh, what we can do is um, under catalog, I'm just going to create this in the same database where I put the other file. I'm going to uh, create a new feature class, and I'm going to call it uh, uh, targets. And it's going to be a polygon. I want it to be a polygon. And then I want it to, I don't really care about having any fields yet because we're, 
the fields are going to be calculated through the uh, we're going to ask inside each of these polygons what's there actually I'm going to add one field called uh, target well I don't really never mind I can just use the object ID one's going to be one one's going to be two that's fine I need, just need a way to distinguish the two and then uh, I'm going to make sure that I utilize the same uh, the same coordinate system that the data is in, which is by default it should be, unless I've changed the coordinate system of the map. And then I'm going to choose, uh, that's, that's fine to choose the default in terms of tolerance and resolution, and then just hit finish. All right, so now I can add my targets to the map, and right now it's an empty layer. It doesn't contain any uh, data at all. There's no, there's no fields. I'm sorry, there's no uh, features, there's no rows. So what I can do is go under the edit toolbar and say that I want to create new features, new targets. And then I have to draw a new target totally inside of there. Okay, I want it, I don't want it to I don't want it I don't want to get any pixels that may actually be partial pixels. So I've got that feature. I, I saved it. In fact, I'm going to hit uh, save before I move on. Okay. So I'm going to create another uh, feature totally inside of this polygon. And then I'm going to save that one. Okay. So now I've got those two targets. I go to the attribute table, and they're both there. One's a little bit bigger. I mean, ideally, they're, they should be the same size because the targets were the same size. But I, I tried to make them uh, so that they were totally inside, and maybe I was a little bit biased on this one because it bloomed so much more than the other one did. Okay, but I, I think those, those are going to be good ones. All right. So I'm going to get out of edit mode. I did save it already. Okay. Such so a toolbar. Oh, I, it doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm trying to get rid of this thing. I don't know how to get rid of it right now. All right. So uh, what we can do, though. This is the last thing we'll do before we end class. We'll get the data almost ready, so we just have to do the empirical line calibration next. So we can we can do a zonal statistics as table right there. And what this is going to do is it's going to take this polygon and it's going to find out what the uh, average value is for a given raster. So we, we choose the targets. And then I'm going to choose the object ID as the zone field. So it's going to, it's basically going to find, for each zone, it's going to find the average value underneath it. So I should have, I have one called one and one called two. So it's going to, it's going to create a average in one and an average in two. Okay. So then my value raster is going to be the raster that I want. And unfortunately, I wish you could just choose this raster and it would give you a different value for each each band, but it doesn't. It actually gives you the average of all of the raster bands. So you have to go in here and select uh, the data that you want. So I'm going to go to this one and choose band one first. And then the table, I'm going to call this, uh, I'm going to call this band one. And then I only want, I only care about the mean, so I'm just going to, to do that. Okay. So I'm going to run this guy. And when it's done, this number right here, it represents the, did this one not save? Oh, it's because I, uh, I forgot to clear the selection. So let's run it again. Sorry about that. 
So it's good to look sometimes. So now this is the mean pixel value right here in band one, 255. That's kind of bad news uh, because it means that we blew that pixel out uh, and uh, and we overexposed. It's, it's, I've told you before, it's better to underexpose than overexpose. Uh, so uh, we're still going to attempt to uh, radiometric correct it. But if, you, if, if they're all 255, uh, it's not good. Uh, but in, in the blue band, it's, it's reasonable. I mean, it's, it's the best one because you expect the most uh, scattering in the blue band. Okay? But, but yeah, that's, uh, that's not good it, to have that blown out like that. So let's look at what it is uh, in band 2 uh, and then band 3 and so on. See, see what I mean by blowing it out is that is that we can't adjust that value too much. It's it's going to be the highest value no matter what. So if there's anything else brighter in the image, it's going to show up as having even more reflectance, which isn't possible. Uh, so that's why you want you want all your data to be within the dynamic range of the of the values, which is what. So this is an 8-bit image. So all the all the pixels range from what to what. 0 to 255. So it's the very highest value. All right, so band 2, uh, and then we're just going to call this band 2. I should call it band 2 stats or something, but I'll just be consistent. So let's run this guy and uh, open. Yeah. Band three. Okay, we're, we're we're a little bit lower, which is what we'd expect. You know, there's less and less scattering. There's a better uh, a better value uh, for each of those. Band four, which is also which is also red. It's just red from the other camera. Still, still pretty high. And then finally band 5, which is the near-infrared uh, of the near-infrared that's just in the, the modified camera. So yeah, those, those, are, those are better values. So, uh, so 199 is, is the value there. So what we're going to do next week when we meet is we're going to take each of these values and they're going to be like... I already did I already close that? Yeah, yeah. They're going to be like this relationship here. So these are going to be the radiance values for every band. So we're going to have six equations where we have our dark target and our bright target. And we're going to uh, have our reflectance values. So we're just going to take the, the, the tables that we've already created, throw them into Excel, and, and come up with a line for each of them. Okay. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to do. Um, uh, and, but we'll do it next week since we're supposed to get out about 2.30. All right. Um, so next week we'll meet here. I'll send out an email if I'm going to fly the, if I find the, uh, the, the fixed wings camera, the Parrot Sequoia. I'll send out an email, and uh, I'll fly it like Monday or Tuesday. What? I don't know all of your schedules. Or I could maybe I could even fly it on on Saturday afternoon. Uh, so how many people would be interested in coming if I did it? Uh, Monday or Tuesday around midday. I mean, not interested in coming, could come, because I know some of you can't come and it's fine. Okay, so I got like four. What if I did it Saturday around two, because I actually have a commitment in the morning? Maybe two, two or three. So about the same. Okay, so if I find it, uh, I'll let you know um, and I'll do it one of those two, uh, two times. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of hope, though, because I, I literally like tore up uh, 
my my home office and Chris's office and because Chris is the one that borrow, borrowed it. Um, so yeah, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and. Uh, Where is the, oh, there it is. Go ahead and stop the recording.